that, I think we are ready for the first lecture. As you can imagine, basic as it is, is on hemodynamics. Um, so when you think about it, the heart is the most efficient pump in the world. So you could run a marathon or you could have a really busy day or night on call and you're exhausted and you go to bed and you pass out, but your heart is still working, okay? So it never stops. It starts in utero and it doesn't stop until you're dead. So uh, yes, this is a watering can, but when I see a picture of a heart like this, I think of this is just a watering can. So you have the uh, mitral valve here uh, coming down to the watering can apex. Then it goes out to the watering can spout, which is the LVOT, and the aortic valve. So it's got to be more complicated than this. Or else you wouldn't be able to do 70 beats per minute, 60 times an hour, 24 hours a day, 600, uh, 365 days a year for 75 years, which it turns out to be like three, three uh, billion. So when you did your uh, anatomic dissections yesterday, I hope you noticed that the uh, myocardial fibers run in various directions. And this was known for, since Leonardo da Vinci uh, time, that when they dissected the heart, they saw that the myocardial fibers are arranged so that just like when you're twisting uh, water, wringing a towel to get out the water, that's how the heart actually twists. So that you have this, uh, that you have this um, clockwise rotation in uh, the base and a counterclockwise rotation at the apex. Okay, so that is how the heart normally contracts. And that's how you're able to get uh, 70 beats per minute uh, 60 times an hour, 24 hours a day, 600, or 365 uh, days a year for 75 years, and not even know it many times. So uh, the role of the mitral valve annulus, the annulus is a dynamic structure, okay? It's always moving. Everything in your heart is always moving. And when the mitral valve uh, is... Um, when the mitral valve is uh, open, blood rushes in, and uh, the, the, uh, the annulus expands as well to get all that blood in. And then when, you, when the mitral valve closes and the ventricle starts contracting, the annulus starts coming in. And the aorto uh, mitral curtain is where the spout is for the, um, on the other side, it's the LVOT. That expands during systole. So basically, um, that is to say that in the recent years, uh, we know more about what happens inside the heart, uh, not just structurally. So that um, there's been many different ways now that we can look at actual blood flow into the heart. And um, so this is a CMR-derived uh, image of what the red blood, the path that the red blood cells take when they come into the heart. Uh, and they, form, they don't just like come in like a watering can. They make certain patterns so that you can see uh, blood flowing into the uh, left atrium goes from the right, from the right pulmonary vein, it goes straight down to the mitral valve. Here's the mitral valve here. And uh, the blood from the left pulmonary vein comes toward the right pulmonary vein, and it makes this circle, this vortex, okay? So that uh, if you think about it, you don't want the red cells to be touching the uh, sides of the chamber. It makes a vortex, okay? And then it goes down so that um, this can be seen graphically, so that blood comes in from, here's the right pulmonary veins, this is the left pulmonary veins. The, air, the arrows kind of show the direction of flow. So it makes a vortex and then uh, goes in atrial, uh, when the atria empty, empties, boom, this is the velocity. So that's high velocity right here, the velocity scale. 
So basically this happens in the ventricle as well. So what happens uh, when blood flows into the ventricle is that, as you learned yesterday from Dr. Laurie's uh, mitral valve um, dissection, blood goes directly to the LV apex. And then some of it goes around this way. This is a posterior mitral valve leaflet, and that's the anterior leaflet, okay? So blood actually goes this way, pushing the posterior mitral leaflet closed in this direction. And that this board, so this is a small vortex, this is a larger vortex pushing the anterior leaflet closed, okay? So when that happens, once that mitral valve closed, it approximates, it's like a, a keystone of a Roman arch, okay? So it's pushed together by the forces of blood. And then once it's closed, this vortex takes over this vortex, and then when, uh, when systole happens, it rushes out the aorta. So this is actually a uh, color flow Doppler uh, with vector flow mapping uh, that shows the arrows show the direction of blood flow and the length of the arrow shows the velocity of the blood flow. And you can see these uh, vortices forming in early diastasis. So the time in red up here is a time before the R wave. The R wave is very important as you learned yesterday. So you learned it, whoever did the, um, the um, uh, balloon pump lecture, uh, a, the balloon pump demonstration, and also with Dr. Laurie's demonstration, the R wave is the start of isovolemic contraction. Okay, so that's the time before isovolemic contraction. And you can see the blood flow rushes in, heads to the apex, some of it goes this way, some of it goes this way, so, and then, um, the direct, these arrows show the direction of blood flow, and then once the mitral valve closes right up here, so the mitral valve's open, posterior anterior leaflet, posterior anterior leaflet, closed. And then blood rushes out the aorta after uh, the aortic valve opens, but that's the direction of flow. And here you can see normal LV inflow pattern with, uh, this is TTE imaging, so it's gonna be upside down but uh, you can see the direction of blood flow into from the left uh, atrium. So from the left atrium to the left ventricle, circling around is the major vortex and out the aorta. Now this is, uh, shows uh, what happens basically after diastole. So you have this, this is also vector flow mapping with uh, uh, TTE. You can see how uh, these vortex, this major vortex forms and then comes right out the, uh, the pathway is out the LVOT. And the LVOT is the only part of the uh, left ventricle that actually expands during systole. Okay, so that spout, you know, when you see that watering can, that doesn't move, it's like, like this. But actually it expands. That's the whole thing with uh, the interaction between the mitral annulus and the aortic, uh, aortomitral curtain. The LVOT expands, and that's a very important part of, um, of systole. So you can see how the, uh, the uh, myocardial fibers and the twisting motion helps the formation of these vortices. There's a reason to it. And there have been many other um, modalities uh, to image um, this kind of flow inside the ventricles, but they all confirm the same thing, that you get vortex formation, and that's how you get this efficiency of the heart that you don't even know that it's beating, um, but it's actually working for you. So everything starts with the most basic thing, and that's the EKG. And as we know in life, timing is everything. So you know what happens at the R wave is isovolemic uh, contraction. So I gave you some handouts for uh, your uh, take home enjoyment um, of the relationship between uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressures and central venous pressures. This is on every single board, and I'm sure you remember, um, that there is uh, the cardiac cycles, uh, you can start it anywhere you want, but I like to start it with the um, Y descent because that's, um, uh, that is going to be your ventricular, passive ventricular filling. So you can uh, fill out the blanks um, that I gave you there on a chart 
So what I put there is um, uh, what happens in the atria, what happens in the ventricles, and if the valves are open or closed. And you know we can do that later and you can show me. Um, so what happens in the atria is the opposite of what happens in the ventricle, and I think that's how people get confused sometimes. So you just have to know that the uh, pulmonary, pulmonary artery occlusion and the central venous pressures reflect what's happening in the atria, not in the ventricle, okay? And any positive rise is pressure is going up, and anything negative means pressure going down, and you can fill that out later. So the descents can only mean two things, one of two things, relaxation and emptying. The waves can only mean one of two things, contraction and filling. So you, you get a 50-50 shot and what you fill it out if it's right or wrong. So tissue Doppler velocity. So we can measure this on echo putting a, your, um, your um, cursor right on the uh, either the mitral or tricuspid annulus. You can see this is annular movement. Like we were talking before, annular movement is very uh, important. So you can document uh, isovolemic contraction time, that's the R wave, how long that is, to the point that the ventricle uh, ejects, then you have isovolemic relaxation time, which is the, the first phase of diastole, then the ventricular filling, fast filling, and then uh, diastasis, and then uh, atrial contraction. So you can see, this happens in both the right and left ventricle, you can time this up with the EKG, and you can see just from annular motion uh, what uh, the timing of what the events occur in the heart. Now, pulmonary venous flow patterns, um, you have blood always flowing, it's, blood is always flowing, and it's like a weird concept to understand that it's like always flowing into the atria, it never stops flowing. Okay, the only time blood does not flow into the atrium from the pulmonary vein or the IVC, SVC, is when the atrium contracts and the pressure in the atrium is just too high, so it goes backwards. So that's the only physiologic time you're gonna get reversal of flow into the pulmonary veins. And you can put your cursor in the pulmonary vein and you can see this flow. Same thing with the mitral inflow pattern. So you have this, uh, when the pressure in the uh, left atrium gets to be higher than the pressure in the left ventricle, bam, the mitral valve opens, you get a fast rush of blood into the left ventricle, and then uh, at some point the pressure in the uh, left atrium and the pressure in the left ventricle equalize, so you get diastasis, it's like one chamber. And then the A wave, comp the, uh, uh, a -wave uh, on the EKG stimulates the atria to contract, boom, you get that second rush of flow, and that's the, the A wave on the uh, mitral inflow pattern. The aortic inflow pattern, uh, this is normal LVOT inflow. God is good, it's one meter per second, very easy. So how do we get that? So echo is different from, uh, you know, getting uh, gradients from the cath lab. In the cath lab, you stick a, a transducer in there and you measure it, that's what you do. But for us, we actually have to use uh, the frequency shift of red blood cells to calculate a velocity. And the caveat with that is that there's a cosine theta so that your transducer has to be within 20 degrees of your red blood cell direction. So um, this could be uh, off a little bit if you're not uh, parallel to the direction of flow. However, we measure, uh, velo we measure the velocity and we use that to get a pressure. So that um, we use the simplified Bernoulli equation, uh, the change in pressure between the uh, upstream and downstream is four times uh, V max squared. So what's the normal velocity of blood through the heart? We all said that blood is always moving, moving, moving. So uh, you can see that the, uh, pr the velocity of flow on the left side of the heart is a little bit faster than the blood flow uh, velocities on the right side of the heart. And standard is one meter per second. So what if the blood flow velocity in the aorta was four meters per second? What would be the pressure gradient between the LVOT and uh, the aorta? 64, right? So it would be, the pressure would be four times four squared, 64. Okay, so that means that you have flow acceleration. That means there's aortic stenosis and the ventricle is squeezing well. It's just like when you have a, a hose, garden hose, and you put your finger over the nozzle or the 
open hose and it accelerates. Okay, so that's flow acceleration. That's what happens. So putting all that together, uh, you can, it all starts with the EKG. You have uh, the R wave is isovolemic uh, contraction. So you know that. You can uh, look at the uh, mitral inflow velocities, pulmonary veins, and hepatic vein inflow, and uh, tissue Doppler. So that's like the basics of echo, but it's also the basics of hemodynamics. So you have to know all this. And this is a, um, something from uh, Dr. Lay at the University of Minnesota. What they did was they, uh, they divided, they used electrophysiology and MRI to divide diastole into 2,700 uh, time steps. So this is a computational grid of what happens um, with blood flow in, coming into the ventricle, creating these rings. And there's an E-ring and an A-ring. And everything that we have now in science confirms the importance of the vortex. And you'll see that in many, many, many lectures probably today, that the vortical formation is very, very important to the uh, efficiency of the heart. So basically, in conclusion, uh, the efficiency of the heart to provide maximal forward stroke volume depends on optimal timing, diastolic formation of vortices, and contraction in all chambers, atria and ventricle. So abnormalities in any of these factors will decrease the efficiency of the heart. So if you can think of something, what's an abnormality that affects, that concerns timing and arrhythmia? If you, I'm guarantee you, if you have a, your normal heart rate is 70 and all of a sudden you go into SVT at, at 180, you'll know it. You'll know it and you'll feel that short of breath in one heartbeat. Okay, so that's going to affect it. Diastolic formation of vortices. What's going to happen to change that? Okay, mitral stenosis. Uh, the, it will, you, the blood flow is going to be messed up when it comes into the uh, left ventricle. Or uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the ventricular shape uh, in diastole is going to affect it. It's going to move that blood in a weird direction. Okay? Uh, how about contraction, regional wall motion abnormalities? Okay, that's going to affect the, the flow, the efficiency of the heart. So all these things um, uh, uh, you know, affect the efficiency of the heart, and that's because the heart is the most efficient pump. And uh, the body, um, our body likes homeostasis. Okay, so our pH is about the same range, our temperature is maintained in the same range, our electrolytes are in the same range. Our bodies can adjust to things given time, like aortic stenosis. It takes a long time for someone to have a problem with aortic stenosis. And arrhythmia, bam, that happens fast, you're gonna notice it right away. So this is a segue into my very good friend, Dr. Jamie Ramsey's presentation, uh, Physiology of Cardiopulmonary Bypass, because that's something that happens in one heartbeat, too. And the body doesn't like that. Thank you so much. Thank you.